He started, hasn't he? At least let him talk then, Mama. Alexandra stopped her. This prince may be a great fraud and not an idiot at all, she whispered to Aglaya. Very likely. I could see that ages ago, answered Aglaya. And it's mean on his part to pretend. What does he think to gain by it? I was greatly struck by my first impression, repeated the prince. When I traveled out of Russia through various German towns, all I did was stare in silence, and I remember asking no questions. It was after a long series of severe and agonizing bouts of my illness, and I would always fall into a total stupor whenever the illness was intensifying or attacks came one after another. I lost the power of remembering things altogether, and although my mind went on working, it was as if my capacity for logical thought was disrupted. I couldn't string more than two or three ideas together at any one time, so it seems to me. Whenever the attack subsided, I grew well and strong again, just like now. I remember feeling unbearably sad. I felt like crying, even. I was in a continual state of wonderment and anxiety. It affected me terribly that all this was alien. That much I realized. It was this sense of the alien which was crushing me. I shook off this blankness completely, I recall, one evening in Baal, as we were entering Switzerland. And what roused me was the braying of an ass in the town market. That ass really astonished me. It greatly took my fancy for some reason, and at the same time my head seemed to clear suddenly. An ass? That's odd, remarked Madame Yapanchina. Though what's odd about it? One of us could well fall in love with a donkey, she remarked, glancing angrily at the giggling girls. It happened in mythology. Continue, Prince. <laughs> Since then, I've been extremely fond of donkeys. There's a kind of common chord between us. I began asking questions about them, because I'd never seen them before, and I became convinced at once that they are the most useful of creatures. Hard-working, strong, patient, cheap, and long-suffering. And through that donkey, I suddenly began to like everything about Switzerland, and my former sadness passed off completely. All this is very strange, but you can leave off about the donkey. Let's get on to something else. Why are you still laughing, Aglaya? And you, Adelaida? The prince told us about the donkey beautifully. He saw it himself. And what have you seen? You've never been abroad. I've seen an ass, Mama, said Adelaida. And I've heard one, too added Aglaya. All three laughed again. The prince began laughing along with them. It's too bad of you, remarked Madame Yepanchina. You must excuse them, prince. They're good-hearted, really. I'm always scolding them, but I love them just the same. They're scatterbrained and flighty, mad things. <coughs> well, why not? laughed the prince. I wouldn't have missed the chance in their place either. I'm still on the side of the ass, though. The ass is a good and useful creature. And are you good? I'm just being curious, asked Madame Yepanchina. Everyone burst out laughing again. That wretched donkey again. I wasn't thinking of that at all, cried Madame Yepanchina. Please believe me, Prince, I wasn't... Hinting? Oh, I believe you, really I do. And the Prince continued laughing. I'm very glad you can laugh about it. I can see that you're a most good-natured young man, said Madame Yepanchina. Not always, the prince replied. Well, I am, put in Madame Yepanchina unexpectedly. If you want to know, I'm always good-hearted. It's my one failing, because one shouldn't be, not all the time. I very often lose my temper with them, for example, and with Ivan Fyodorovich especially, but the awful thing is, I'm kindest of all when I'm angry. Just now, before you came in, I lost my temper and made out I didn't and couldn't understand what was going on. I tend to do that sometimes, just like a child. Aglaya taught me a lesson. Thank you, Aglaya. It's all nonsense, though. I'm not as silly as I seem or as my daughters like to make me out. I have a mind of my own, and I'm no shrinking violet. I'm saying this without malice, by the way. Come over here, Aglaya, and kiss me. There, that's enough. 
she remarked when Aglaya had kissed her feelingly on lips and hand. Do go on, Prince. Perhaps you can remember something more interesting than a donkey. I still don't see how anybody can tell a story straight out like that, said Adelaida again. I wouldn't know how to start. But the Prince will because he's extremely clever. At least ten times more than you, maybe twelve. I hope you'll realize it after this. Prove it to them, Prince. Do go on. The donkey can be left out of it, really. Well now, what did you see abroad apart from that? It was clever about the donkey as well, observed Alexandra. What the prince said about his illness was very interesting. How he started liking everything after one external shock. I've always been interested in how people go mad and then recover their wits, especially if it happens suddenly. Really? Really? cried Madame Yapanchina. I see that you can sometimes be clever as well. That's enough laughing now. You had got up to the Swiss scenery, I think, Prince. Now then. When we got to Lucerne, I was taken out on the lake. I thought it was splendid, but I felt wretched at the same time, said the Prince. Why? asked Alexandra. I don't know. I always feel wretched and uneasy when I see nature like that for the first time. Happy and uneasy at the same time. However, I was still unwell at that time. Oh no, I would love to see it, said Adelaida. I don't know when we're going abroad. I haven't been able to find anything to paint for two years. Both east and south have long been pictured. Find me, Prince, a subject for a picture. I don't understand anything about it, really. It seems to me you just look and paint. I don't know how to look. Why talk in riddles? I don't understand this, Madame Yapanchina broke in. What do you mean, I don't know how to look? You've got eyes, use them. If you don't know how to look here, you won't learn abroad either. Better if you tell us how you looked yourself, Prince. Now that would be better, Adelaida said. The prince learned how to look when he was abroad, didn't he? I don't know. Really, I just recovered my health there. I don't know if I learned to look or not. Incidentally, I was very happy almost all the time. Happy? You know how to be happy? cried Aglaya. So how can you say you never learned to look? You could teach us. Yes, teach us, please. Adelaida laughed. I can't teach anything said the prince, laughing in his turn. I lived in that Swiss village practically all the time I was abroad. An occasional short trip outside. What have I got to teach you? To start with, it was just pleasant, and soon I began to recover my health. After that, every day became precious to me. The more so, the longer time went on, so that I began to notice it. I used to go to bed very contented, and rise even happier. Why all that should be so, I should be hard put to tell you. So you never felt like leaving? You felt no urge to go elsewhere? Asked Alexandra. At first, at the very beginning, yes, there were times when I used to have very restless moods. I kept thinking how I was going to spend my life. I wanted to test the future that awaited me. There were certain moments when I used to feel restless. You know how those moments come, especially when you are alone. We had a waterfall there, quite a small one, dropping high off the mountain in a delicate thread, almost vertical, white, pattering, foaming. It fell from a great height, but it seemed quite low. It was a good half mile off, but it seemed only 50 yards away. I loved to listen to it at night. It was in moments like those that I sometimes reached a peak of anxiety. Also at midday sometimes, on mountain walks, I'd be alone among the mountains, pine trees all around me, ancient, tall, resinous. Up there on the rock, an old castle, medieval and ruinous. Our village far away below, barely visible, the sun bright in the blue sky, a fearful silence. It was there that I used to sense a something that kept calling me elsewhere. And it seemed that if I walked straight ahead for a long, long time, past the line, that line where the sky and earth meet, the whole puzzle would be resolved, and I should see a new life, a thousand times more vital and tumultuous than ours. I kept dreaming of a big city like Naples, 
All palaces, life, and thunderous noise. What didn't I dream? Then it seemed to me that even in prison one might discover an immense life. I read that last laudable sentiment in my school anthology when I was twelve, said Aglaya. It's all philosophy, observed Adelaida. You're a philosopher, come to teach us. Perhaps you're right, smiled the prince. I am indeed a philosopher. And who knows, perhaps I really do mean to teach people. That's possible. Indeed it is. And your philosophy is exactly the same as Ulampia Nikolaevna's, Aglaya rejoined. She's a civil service widow, comes to us, a sort of hanger-on. Her one concern in life is cheapness, how cheaply one can live. All her talk is about kopecks, and yet she has money, you know. She's a complete fraud. It's the same with your immense life in prison, and perhaps your four years' happiness in the country that you sold your Naples for. At a profit, too, it seems, if only a few kopecks were. As regards prison life, there is room for disagreement, said the prince. I heard the story of one man who had spent nearly 12 years in prison. He was one of my professor's patients. He had recurrent fits, and he would get restless sometimes, he used to cry, and once even tried to kill himself. His life in jail was very grim, I can assure you, but by no means to be measured in kopecks. And yet all the companionship he had was a spider and a sapling growing under his window. But better if I tell you of another man I met last year. He had a very strange story to tell. Strange because an incident like that happens only very rarely. This man was led out along with others onto a scaffold and had his sentence of death by shooting read out to him for political offenses. About twenty minutes later, a reprieve was read out and a milder punishment substituted. However, during the interval between the sentences, twenty minutes or quarter of an hour at least, he lived with a certain conviction that within minutes he would suddenly die. I was extremely eager to listen whenever he recalled his emotions of that time, and I started asking him about it on a number of occasions. He remembered everything with the utmost clarity, and he used to say that he would never forget anything of those minutes. About twenty yards from the scaffold, near where the people and soldiers were standing, three stakes had been dug into the earth, as there were several criminals. The first three were taken to the stakes and bound before being dressed in the death garments, long white smocks, and white hoods over their eyes so they couldn't see the rifles. Then a party of soldiers was lined up opposite each stake. My acquaintance was number eight, so he was due to go to the stake in the third group. A priest went round everyone with a cross. It worked out that he had five minutes to live, no more. He used to say that those five minutes seemed to him an eternity, an immense richness. It seemed that in those five minutes, he could live through so many lives, that there could be no thinking now of the last instant. He divided his time up. He calculated the time in which to say farewell to his comrades, and allotted some two minutes to that, then two more minutes to reflect upon himself, and then look about him for the last time. He clearly recalls making these dispositions and the way he calculated them. He was dying at 27, healthy and strong. In bidding goodbye to his comrades, he remembered asking one of them a somewhat irrelevant question and even being very interested in the answer. Then, after he had said goodbye to his comrades, came the two minutes he had set aside for thinking about himself. He already knew what he was going to think about, he kept wanting to imagine as swiftly and vividly as possible how on earth it could be that now he existed and was alive, and in three minutes' time he would merely be something, something or somebody, but who though, and where? He thought he could resolve all this in two minutes. A church stood not far off, and its gilded roof sparkled in the sunshine. He remembered staring with an awful intensity at that roof and the sunlight glancing from it. He couldn't drag his eyes away. It occurred to him that those rays were his new state of being, and that in three minutes 
he would somehow merge with them. His revulsion at the unknown, at the new, now that it was inevitable and imminent, was dreadful. But he says that nothing was more terrible at that moment than the nagging thought, what if I didn't have to die? If life was returned to me, what an eternity it would be. And it would all be mine. I would turn every minute into an age. Nothing would be wasted. Every minute would be accounted for. Nothing would be frittered away. He used to say that this thought finally roused him to such a pitch of anger that he wanted them to hurry up and shoot him and have done with it. The prince suddenly fell silent. Everyone waited for him to go on and draw some conclusion. Have you finished? said Aglaya. What? Yes, said the prince, rousing himself from his momentary reverie. But why did you tell us about all this? Just, it came back to me. It seemed relevant. You're very abrupt, prince, remarked Alexandra. You probably wanted to demonstrate that one shouldn't value a single instant in mere copex, and that sometimes five minutes can outweigh a fortune. Oh, very laudable, but if I may ask, this friend of yours who told you about his sufferings, he had his sentence commuted, didn't he? So he was presented with that eternal life. So what did he do with those riches afterwards? Did he account for every minute? Oh, no. He told me himself. I asked him about that. He didn't live like that at all and wasted an awful lot of minutes. So it follows from your example... It follows that one can't really live one's life counting every minute. It's just impossible for some reason. Yes, for some reason it's just impossible, the prince echoed. That's what I thought myself. But somehow I just can't believe it all the same. That means you think you're going to live more wisely than anyone else, said Aglaya. Yes, I thought that too sometimes. And think so now? And think so now, replied the prince, smiling gently and almost timidly at Aglaya. Then all at once he laughed out loud again and looked brightly at her. Modesty indeed, said Aglaya, almost nettled. And how brave you are. Really, here you are laughing, and I was so shaken by all he told me, I dreamed about it. Just those five minutes. He again gave his hearers an earnest and searching look. You're not angry with me for any reason, are you? He inquired suddenly, apparently disconcerted, but managing to look everyone straight in the eye. What for? cried all three girls, astonished. Well, because I keep lecturing you. Everyone laughed. If you are angry, don't be, he said. I'm well aware that I have less experience than others, and I'm less worldly wise than anybody. Perhaps I talk very strangely at times... Now he was definitely at a loss. If you say you were happy, that means you lived more, not less. Why do you wriggle and try to apologize then? Began Aglaya, severely censorious. And please don't worry about lecturing us. You've nothing to be superior about. One could fill a hundred years of happiness with your sort of quietism. Whether you saw an execution or a little finger, you would draw equally laudable conclusions and still be happy. That sort of living's easy. What you keep getting so angry about, I fail to understand, said Madame Yepanchina, who had been observing the speaker's faces for a long time. And I don't understand what you're talking about either. What's all this nonsense about a finger? The prince talks beautifully, though a bit on the sad side. Why are you discouraging him? He was laughing when he started, and now he's quite depressed. It's all right, Maman. It's a pity you never saw an execution, Prince. I wanted to ask you something. I have seen one, responded the Prince. You have? cried Aglaya. I should have guessed. That's the finishing touch. If you have seen one, how can you say you lived happily all the time? Well, aren't I right? They didn't execute people in your village, did they? Asked Adelaide. I saw it in Lyon. I went there with Schneider. He took me. I came across it as soon as I arrived. Well then, did you enjoy it? Was it very edifying? Was it instructive? Asked Aglaya. 
I didn't enjoy it at all. I was rather ill afterwards, but I admit I was riveted by the sight. I couldn't tear my eyes away. I couldn't have either, said Aglaia. They're very much against women going to watch. They even write about such women in the papers. If they say it's not suitable for women, by the same token, they're saying it's all right for a man, and so justifying it. I congratulate them on their logic. You think the same way too, of course. Tell us about the execution, Adelaida interrupted. I would much prefer not at the moment. The prince was troubled and frowned slightly. It's as if you begrudge telling us, Aglaia reproached him. No, it's because I was telling someone about this execution just now. Who? Your footman, while I was waiting. What footman? Came from all sides. The one who sits in the entrance hall, with the graying hair, reddish face. I was sitting there before going in to see General Yepanchin. That's an odd thing to do, remarked Madame Yepanchina. The prince is a democrat, Aglaya put it bluntly. Well, if you've told Alexei, you can't refuse us now, can you? I would certainly like to hear it, Adelaida repeated. A little while ago, actually, the prince addressed her, quite animated once more. He seemed to get excited in a very quick and unaffected way. When you asked me to give you the subject for a picture, I actually thought of this one. Draw the face of a condemned man in the minute before the guillotine falls. While he's still standing on the scaffold before lying down on the plank they have. The face? Just the face? Asked Adelaida. A strange subject? And what kind of picture would that be? I don't know. Why on earth not? The prince insisted with some heat. I saw a picture like that in Baal not long ago. I'd very much like to tell you... I'll tell you some other time. It made a great impression on me. You must certainly tell us about the Baal picture later, said Adelaida, but now explain this execution picture for me. Can you tell me how you imagine it yourself? How should one draw that face? Just the face, yes? What kind of face is it, then? It is exactly a minute before death, began the prince perfectly readily, at once carried away by his recollection and apparently oblivious to all else. Just when he has climbed the stair and set foot upon the scaffold, that was when he glanced in my direction. I looked into his face and understood it all. But how can one convey it? I would be terribly pleased, terribly pleased, if you or anyone else could draw that face. Best of all, if it were you. At the time, I thought a picture would do a lot of good. To do it, one really has to imagine everything that had taken place earlier, every single thing. He had been living in prison and expecting to wait at least a week before the execution. He had been reckoning on the usual formalities, the documents being sent somewhere and taking a week to come back. But this time, for some reason, the process was curtailed. At five o'clock in the morning, he had been asleep. It was towards the end of October. At five o'clock, it's still cold and dark. The prison governor came in very quietly with a warder and touched him gently on the shoulder. He raised himself on one elbow and saw the light. What's the matter? The execution is at ten o'clock. Still half asleep, he didn't believe it, and started to argue that the document was only due in a week's time. But when he was fully awake, he stopped arguing and went quiet. That's what they told me. Then he said, Still, it's hard like this, all of a sudden. Then fell silent again, there being nothing more he wanted to say. Then, three or four hours go by on the usual things. The priest, breakfast for which he gets wine, coffee, and beef. Well, is that a mockery or not? Just think how cruel that is. And yet, on the other hand, honestly, these innocent people do it out of the goodness of their hearts, convinced they're being humane. Then comes the dressing up. You know what that involves for a condemned man. Then, finally, they take him through the town to the scaffold. I imagine he thinks he still has an eternity left to live while they're taking him. 
I imagine he probably thought as he went along, it's a long time yet, three streets yet to live. After this one, there's the next, then the one after with the bakers on the corner. It'll be ages before we reach the bakers. All around, there's the crowd, shouting, noise, 10,000 faces, 10,000 eyes. All that had to be born. And then, worst of all, the thought, there's 10,000 of them, and not one of them is being executed. But I am. Well, all that is by way of preliminary. The ladder is put up against the scaffold. Suddenly, he begins to weep in front of it. This strong and courageous man, a great evildoer, so they said. All this time, the priest has been inseparable from him, traveling with him in the cart, talking all the time, though hardly heard. He would start to listen, then fail to comprehend more than two words. It must have been so. Finally, he began to mount the ladder. His legs are bound so that he walks in tiny steps. The priest, a perceptive man, no doubt, stops talking and just keeps offering him the cross to kiss. At the bottom of the ladder, he had been very pale. But after he had climbed it and stood on the scaffold, he became as white as a sheet all of a sudden, as white as a sheet of writing paper. Probably his legs had gone numb and were giving way. Then came nausea, as if his throat was being constricted and almost tickling him. Have you ever felt like that when you've been frightened or in moments of terror, when your reason remains perfectly clear but is no longer in control? I would think that in some inescapable disaster, like the house collapsing about you, for example, one would have an awful desire to just sit down, close one's eyes, and wait. What will be, will be. Just then, when this weakness was beginning, the priest, with a swift gesture, silently placed the cross to his lips. It was a little silver four-ended cross, and he kept putting it to his lips every minute. As soon as the cross touched his lips, he would open his eyes and come to life again, as it were, and his legs moved on. He kept kissing the cross avidly, hurrying to do so, as if anxious not to forget to take something with him just in case. But he would scarcely have felt anything religious at that moment. And so it went on, right up to the board itself. It's odd, but very few people faint in these last seconds. On the contrary, the brain is fearfully alive and active, must be working, working, working ever so hard like a machine. I can imagine all kinds of thoughts hammering away, all half-formulated, perhaps even absurd, irrelevant thoughts like, that one's staring. He's got a wart on his forehead. The executioner there, he's got a rusty bottom button. Yet all the while, you know and remember everything. There's a certain point you cannot forget, and you must not faint. And all things move and revolve around that point. And to think this goes on to the last quarter of a second when your head is lying on the block and waiting and knowing, and all at once it hears the iron sliding above. You would certainly hear that. Speaking for myself, if I was lying there, I would deliberately listen for it and catch the sound. There might only be the tenth part of an instant, but you would certainly hear it. And just imagine, people still argue that perhaps the head, when it flies off, knows for a second that it has done so. What an idea! And what if it were five seconds? Draw the scaffold so that the very last rung only can be seen clearly and close to. The felon has placed his foot on it. The head and face is white as a sheet. The priest is holding out the cross while the other greedily protrudes his blue lips and stares and knows everything. The cross and the head, that's the picture. The faces of the priest, the executioner, his two assistants, and several heads and eyes from below, all that can be drawn in as distant background, indistinct, subordinate. That's the sort of picture it should be. The prince fell silent and regarded them all. That's not much like quietism, of course, said Alexandra to herself. Well, now tell us how you fell in love said Adelaida. 
The prince stared at her in astonishment. <laughs> Listen, Adelaida hurried on. You have still to tell us about the Baal picture, but just now I want to hear about your being in love. Don't try to deny it, you were. Besides, as soon as you start telling a story, you stop being a philosopher. As soon as you stop speaking, you're ashamed of what you've been saying, Aglaya remarked suddenly. Why is that? Now that is just silly, said Madame Yepanchina sharply with an indignant look at Aglaya. Not clever at all, confirmed Alexandra. Don't believe her, Prince, Madame Yepanchina told him. She does that on purpose, out of spite. She's not as bad-mannered as that. Don't pay any attention to their teasing. They're probably up to something, but they already like you. I can read their faces. And I can read their faces, too, said the prince, emphasizing his words. What do you mean? asked Adelaida curiously. What do you know about our faces? the other two inquired. But the prince was silent and grave. Everyone awaited his answer. I will tell you later, he said, softly and earnestly. You're really trying to intrigue us, cried Aglaya, and so serious. Well, all right, Adelaida once more hurried on. But if you're such an expert on faces, then you must have been in love. That means I was right. Tell us the story, do. I was never in love, said the prince, quietly earnest as before. I was happy in a different way. How then? In what way? Very well. I'll tell you, said the prince, apparently deep in thought. Chapter 6 Here you all are. The prince began, looking at me with such curiosity that if I didn't satisfy it, you would probably be very angry with me. No, I'm just joking, he added hastily, smiling. There, there it was children all the time. I spent all my time with children, just children. They were the village children, the whole crowd of them at school. I didn't actually teach them. Oh, no, there was a schoolmaster to do that, Jules Thibault. I did teach them a little bit as well, but I mostly just spent time with them all the four years I was there. I wanted nothing else. I used to tell them everything, keeping nothing back. Their parents and relatives used to get very angry with me because their children couldn't do without me in the end, always crowding about me. The schoolmaster finally got to be my worst enemy. I made a lot of enemies there all because of the children. Even Schneider took me to task. What were they all so afraid of? You can tell a child everything. Everything. I've always been struck by how little adults understand children, even their own fathers and mothers. Nothing should be kept from children on the pretext that they're little and it's too soon for them to know. Such a sad, wretched idea. Children themselves are well aware that their parents regard them as too small and uncomprehending when actually they understand everything. Adults don't realize that children can give extremely valuable advice in the most difficult situations. Heavens, when that pretty little bird looks at you, so happy and trusting, you are ashamed to betray it. I call them little birds because the earth holds nothing finer than a bird. Still, the main reason everybody in the village was angry with me was because of a certain incident. Thibault was simply jealous of me. At first, he kept shaking his head, wondering how it was that the children understood everything I taught them and practically nothing he did. Later on, he started laughing at me when I said that neither of us would teach them anything. They would teach us. How could he be jealous of me and tell stories about me when he lived among the children himself? The soul is healed through contact with children. There was one patient in Schneider's establishment, a most wretched individual. His plight was so dreadful that it can hardly be paralleled. He'd been sent there to be treated for insanity. In my view, he wasn't insane. He was simply terribly distressed. And that was the extent of his illness. 
If he only knew what our children came to mean for him in the end. Still, better if I tell you about that patient some other time. What I'll tell you now is how it all began. At first, the children didn't take to me at all. I was so big and awkward. I know I'm not very good looking either, and I was a foreigner to cap it all. They made fun of me at first, and later on they even started throwing stones at me when they caught sight of me kissing Marie. And I only kissed her once. No, don't laugh. The prince hastened to restrain his smirking audience. It wasn't anything to do with love. If you only knew what an unhappy creature she was, you would feel as sorry for her.